Good morning. Today is 13 June, the year 2016. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with uh, John Stanier and Kemp Dowdy. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of Captain John Stanier. Uh, Captain Stanier was a cameraman with the King's Own Scottish Borders Light Infantry in the British Army, serving in Cyprus and Yemen uh, in 1960 and 61 during the Cold War. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. John, good to have you here, sir. Thank you. Yep. Pleasure. Okay. Okay, John. Uh, first of all, let's just start with uh, your name. If you would give your name. Yeah, I, my name is John David Stenier. And um, could you spell your last name, please? Yeah, it's S-T-A-N-I-E-R. And where were you born? Uh, I was born in London in 1942. That makes you how many years? Seventy-four. Now, Seventy-four. Okay. And uh, John, <clears throat> were you uh, living with your parents at the time? Uh, yes. Yes, I was. Um, what are your parents' names? What, what's your mother's name? My mother's name is Kathleen, and my father's name was David. David Stenier. Hence the. Stenier. Hence the David in my name, John David Stenier. I see. Uh, yeah. He was in the Royal Air Force during uh, the world uh, during World War II at that time. Yes, time. and um, my mother worked for the British Broadcasting Association. All right, BBC. BBC. Yeah. What she did, I I can't remember. But, uh, right. So you uh, and you lived in London um, during all the bombing, I guess it went on. Well, that the, was the, probably before, I guess. Yeah, the, the main point. bombing was over by then, but there was. A big raid in 1942, and and then we were blessed with the uh, the V1 doodlebug, as my grandmother yes. used to call it, yeah. and the V2 rocket, of which of which there was no defence against. Mm -hmm. uh, now, David Stanier, um, what is his background? Is he uh, uh, the name is French? Is he from France? Um, no, we've we've in, when we tried to find the history, we couldn't find anything but uh, English ancestry, mm -hmm. which would of course be right because the Normans coming over in 1066 right. brought the French influence and a lot of the French language with them. Mm -hmm. So and the names, but the name actually is um, derived from the fact that my original ancestors were in fact um, stonemasons. And in Old English, that is called stone hewer, to oh. hew stone. Oh. So it must have been derived over the centuries into Stanier, you know. Oh. That's the best we can make out. And very interesting, very interesting. And your mother, uh, what, what is her maiden name? Her maiden name was Kathleen Stanier. She came from a family of seven boys, and she was the only girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know too much about her because she um, was one of these English war brides that went back to America uh -huh. in the end. Even though my father, she was married to my father, it was one of those convoluted things, you know, mm -hmm. that, as we all know, happens in wartime, you know. It's a, right. I'm not right. saying right. it was right, but it's... Mm -hmm. It happened in Vietnam and, it, and now, uh, you were born in '42. Did you have any siblings at that particular time? Yeah, I had a I had a brother. Um, How old is he? Anthony, and he he died at the age of 18 months. Oh boy! From uh, pneumonia. 18 months. Okay. Uh, and he he was born two years before you. I think he was. Yes. So you never knew him. Not right? really. No. Okay. Uh, after you came along, were there any other siblings that you had? Just the two of you? There was just the two of us, yeah. My mother subsequently had three other boys in the United States. My, my half-brothers 
but I, I, I really don't have contact with them at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now did you stay in London to the point where you went to school yes, in London? Yes, I did. Uh, when did you, uh, first of all before we get to that, uh, what kind of dwelling did you live in? Were, were you in a home or a flat or, or something? Yeah, we, we had a home, it was called a terraced house. Okay. It was a hundred years old, and like many of the terraces around that part of London were. Mm -hmm. and they were built a hundred years ago for workers in the Woolwich Arsenal, which was very oh, close. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there was mass building all around mm -hmm. uh, to accommodate the workers. Oh. And um, the farther up the hill you went, the better the housing was. Right, uh, because you were either higher up in the hierarchy of the Woolwich Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, you got the best housing. We were at the very top of the hill, okay. but we, uh, my grandmother, was still very poor. So God knows how poor the people at the bottom of the hill were. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, during the war, though, was work available for these people? Yes, the Woolwich Arsenal employed so many people, making guns, shells, bullets. Okay. Um, heavy artillery and the whole of the area there at the bottom of the hill so to speak there was um, an artillery range mm -hmm. where they would test out the big guns and I, I always remember when I was at school there would be, the teachers would say oh, we've been informed that at 12 o'clock today there will be a test of a certain, certain military weapon and then we'd be prepared for the huge bang, you know? They, they give you earmuffs or you just plug your ears? I just plug your ears. <laughs> um, when did you start school? Um, I started school very early age, at like uh, 6, uh, 1940, no, I was born in 42, so I was 4 when I went to school, my first school. And that was under a very, very strict Catholic regime. My whole family are Catholic. Okay. Um, so you went to Catholic school, kind of a nursery school or, or kindergarten type yeah, thing first? Yeah. And then you, in that system you went through three years of kind of basic schooling and then you moved to another building in the same complex where the education got a bit higher and then finally to the top level where you went to the age of uh, 16. Mm -hmm. And then you left. But the education system was very good, very good, and it's it's somewhat like today in so much as it's there. And all you've got to do is take it. Mm -hmm. right? The kids today, it's there, but they don't take it. Was uh, is in this country, some of the problem are the is the ethnic, can't yeah. pronounce it, the yeah. ethnicity of the groups now yeah. that, that's causing a problem when I talk to some of the teachers. Also, the language uh, is an issue. Some people speak, they speak different languages. Was that an issue? No, <laughs> because the, the, the bird didn't come home, the colonialism bird didn't come home to roost until the 50s with, uh, with England. Um, I didn't see a, a, a person of color until I was eight. And that would have been 1950, mm -hmm. when the Carib Caribbean colonies started to come over, emigrate, mm -hmm. and take all the low-level jobs. Same story everywhere you go. They uh, were uh, the Caribbean colonies, meaning part of the Commonwealth countries could come J in. Jamaica, England. yeah, Jamaica yeah, was yeah. a British colony and so forth, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they started to come in, uh, um, those guys started to emigrate here. You know, to great consternation, I remember, you know, of the mm -hmm. indigenous population. And they were not welcomed. And, and to this day, there's still a lot of, a lot of problems there. Yeah. What happened was, is that they, there was a, a minister in the, in the English uh, parliament who said, oh look, the only way we can solve this problem for the future generations, and he emphasized that, is to put all these immigrants back on boats and send them back to where they came from. And there was obviously an outcry over that, especially from the people that would be affected. Right. 
His name was Enoch Powell. And uh, I was a very infamous person for that reason. But now, I went back to London a year and a half ago. And there were people there who were saying, we should have done what Enoch Powell said. Look at this place. You know, and it, it's more than integrated. It's not, it's not even the country that I knew. Right. Not even. No, no, right. no, even the language you know, is being changed mm -hmm. to fit political correctness. Right. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, all I can tell you is it's not the country that I was raised in. Well, it's pretty indicative of every country now, um, especially Commonwealth countries. Um, but let's, uh, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's talk about your days in school now. When you were going to school in your younger years, uh, to Catholic school, what, what were your interests? How, how did you get to school? Did you ride a bicycle, walk, take the bus? Or Walked at first. Walk. It was a 15-minute walk for okay. me. And a 10-minute ride on the bicycle, you know, because it was uphill, downhill, and around corners. So right. it made little difference which way you went, bike or right. foot. And what, what did you like to do in school? What, uh, what were your interests? I was always attracted to art and history. Mm -hmm. I was very, very bad at mathematics, mm -hmm. which was to hurt me later on in, in my life, you know? Right. Um, and English literature, I, I excelled at that. Mm -hmm. um, so you read a lot about Chaucer and Shakespeare yeah, and yeah, all those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was, it, it, like I said earlier on, it was a, a fearsome experience to go through a Catholic education in those days. I mean, all the teachers today would be in jail for doing what they did to us. You know, they would be in jail. There was one particular teacher I remember that used to excel at uh, caning kids, you know, with the cane. Mm -hmm. Hold your hand out. Mm -hmm. Whack. He used to excel at it. He was he was wicked, wicked man. Hmm. And the, the, was this a lay person or a, a, a person of the cloth? No, he's a lay person. Okay. No, the uh, the worst of the people of the cloth would do. We used to be taught by monks as well. If they caught you not paying attention, they'd they'd throw an eraser at you or something like that. You know. <laughs> But the lady teachers, I remember, were particularly nasty because they would lay the edge of a ruler across your knuckles like that two or three times. <laughs> uh, that was the way it was. And you used to live, you either accepted it or you lived in fear of it. And most of us lived in fear of it. And most of us learned because we didn't want to be gained. You know? mm -hmm. How times have changed? Yeah, I'm, I don't know whether... I'm, it may seem strange to you, but I'm glad about that or not, but that kind of discipline made us learn. And I, when I see, my, my kids of today went to good school and they learned. And they did well, or were doing well. But I'm not sure that there should be some, I'm not say physical violence, but there should be something, some punishment of some sort if you don't learn why are we spending all this money on your being taught why are we spending all this money on your football fields and gymnasiums and all that and if all you want to do is spray paint around them and dig them up you know there's got to be some payment for that kind of thing you know mm -hmm. but of course vandalism happened when I was a kid as well you know I can mm -hmm. well remember we, we didn't have spray paint but we'd have our mother's lipstick and we'd steal that and mark some windows up in a house, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the same basic vandalism that existed then is, exists today, but it's at a higher level, I think. But uh, I, uh, I'm not proud of my Catholic education in terms of um, what they did to me. Um, but you learned something. But I learned. And my father... Uh, realized that I'd learned, you know, and he, he, when I left the Catholic system in the 50s, 
and went to a proper, what I call a proper school, but you didn't live in fear of uh, being Was abused. that like a preparatory school? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he insisted that I go there. And he and paid for it. What was the name of the school? It was called Chartersea, and it, or Chartersea Tech. And it was, it was a technical school. Mm-hmm. And in London? In London, yeah. But then I had to travel a long way to get there. I mean, How did you get there? Uh, I can oh, remember really? the schedule very well. At 6.45 in the morning, I would take the number 54 bus to the Woolwich Arsenal Station, which is about a 15-minute ride. Mm-hmm. Then I would take the train to London Bridge, mm-hmm. which is another 20-minute ride, 25-minute ride. And then a number 35 bus to Shoreditch Church and walk the rest of the way. So that was a daily routine for the rest of my schooling. Mm. And how old were you when you were doing all that? Um, I must have started that in 1953 mm-hmm. to 59. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, this uh, preparatory school, Charter C, you said it was a trade type school. It would train you for a particular. Uh, uh, there were several different curriculums in in the technical side of it. One was um, architectural drawing, or technical drawing as we used to mm-hmm. call it, and the other was uh, uh, metal work, mm-hmm. where you'd be required to make tools and things like that mm-hmm. from your own plans, and then you would go on to drawing big machines and things like that. They taught that. In fact, that's what I got my degree in, uh, technical drawing. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it, doesn't, it didn't work like the college system uh, does here. In those days, there were two colleges, Oxford and Cambridge, and you had to be of higher breeding under the English class system to qualify for either of those two colleges. Oh, okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So as a, as a consequence of that, you would complete your school, your school, at what we would complete as high school here. Mm-hmm. There was no further steps. There were no further steps. You could stay on at the same level for a couple of years, whatever, until you're 18, 19, or even 20. Mm-hmm. But there was no school to accommodate that. You would be at the same school. But to get into a university like Cambridge or Oxford or any of these big schools, Eton, um, you said that you were limited as to who can get into these schools? Yeah, as, as strange as it may seem, um, the, the, the English class system in those days, up to the 60s, was still very strictly enforced. It, the mainly, you were mainly judged by the way you spoke. If you spoke like... <laughs> like the, with a Cockney accent. With a Cockney yeah. accent, you were definitely out of the way. You, know, you weren't considered... And the, in that time, they developed an in-between accent between the really, really upper-class accent and the Cockney accent, and that's the accent I have. You have a hybrid type of accent. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Interesting. It's uh, a cross between the Cockney and the higher levels of uh, pronunciation. The way I, w- I would think of it would be kind of, we, we would use the word a snotty type accent. That is that correct. Would, be, yes. would that adequately describe the upper echelon? The upper echelon and the echelon that we graduated to as well, the middle <laughs> one, you know? So there were certain words you could pronounce and people would say, uh, they would immediately call you sir. Oh. Immediately. I always remember so well, I was driving along to work one day in London and this woman with a, a baby stroller pushed out in front of me and I nearly hit them very close. And I yelled at her. I said, what do you think you do? Why don't you look? And she said, I'm sorry, sir, in a broad Cockney accent. She said, I'm sorry, sir, because of my accent. So let me, I just have to ask this question. Did you, in school, did you learn correct speech? We had. We classes had, yeah. just to, for this very reason. Yeah, we had classes with um, elocution classes. Elocution classes. Yeah. We had that in my second school. Interesting. And they would put up strips. I've got one at home actually. 
they put up strips of A's, E's, and that. So you'd say, instead of saying a Cockney A, you'd, they'd say A, where you use your vocal cords at mm. A, B, and that's, if you said it flat, A or B, you can tell the difference, you know. Mm -hmm. So they, they drag that out of you. Mm. It's very complicated and very unfair, the English class system. Very unfair. And you're saying it's not really as prevalent today as it was then? Well, no, it's been absorbed by, <laughs> the, especially by immigration. Oh, but yeah. the, the other way that, that where it's instigated the change was in the 60s, mm -hmm. when we were all flower children, you know, and I, I used to stand behind a camera with a flower in my ear, you know, and everybody said, screw that, you know. That, that this isn't the wartime anymore. This isn't, we're not under the control of our parents who fought and died for us mm -hmm. but nonetheless we we all felt a liberation from what they must have felt through going through the war years mm -hmm. you know and that which they tried to instill upon us mm -hmm. you know I bought my first house and my then father-in-law who was a, a was a worker in the Woolwich Arsenal he said why are you trying to buy a house when the government can provide you with one. Mm -hmm. That was the mentality. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I want a, I want a house. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, uh, uh, when did you graduate from um, um, the, the, your prep school? Um, uh, what uh, was the name of it? Charter Sea. Charter Sea. Charter Sea, that's yes. right. Chartersy. Um, 1959. And you were at what age at that point? 17. Okay, and uh, when you were going to Charter Sea, was it an all-boys school or was it a co-ed school? Yeah, it was all boys until the year I left and they put the girls in. <laughs> well, that must have we been were really pissed off about oh, that. You were. Um, did you have a girlfriend in the, uh, during the course of going to high school where you'd go to dances or battalions no, or whatever? No. No, okay. no not, not, not many of us did for some strange reason, I, which I can't. Yeah, that's just the way, the, on. the way it worked. Now, when you graduated from Charter Sea, um, now you're talk going into 1960. You mentioned the flower years here in San Francisco. That was when it was beginning. Um, what did you do at that point when you graduated? What, 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 where did where did your okay, life take so you? Okay, so there's at a little point? gap here between yeah. the flower section and when I left school. Yeah. yeah. Um, my teacher in the in the sixth form, as we used to call it in the old English way, mm -hmm. uh, he had a friend in the film business, and he knew that I wanted to be in the film business. You did want to be in. Yes. How did you know that? Uh, when did you make up that determination? I don't know. I don't know. It's, I, at a very dad, young age. My dad it? gave me a camera once, and I I used to go around with that, and I developed oh, you a you did. Great so that was a hobby that you had since. It's since kind a of a hobby, yeah. Yeah, and then at my school was also one of the, the teachers that taught um, uh, sewing and all that to the girls, which was then uh, a very popular class. Mm -hmm. um, she, her husband was a film director mm -hmm. at the BBC, mm -hmm. British Broadcasting mm -hmm. Association, mm -hmm. and he encouraged me as well. Okay. And then I formed a club. So he acted as kind of your mentor yeah, absolutely. And he, he and his wife, yes. And who his, is this guy? His name was Jack Gold. Jack he was Gold. Quite a very well he was a very known. important person in your life. Absolutely. But he was also, uh, he was very famous you know, over the latter years. And he passed away uh, a few years back. But he really was the one that stimulated me into the film business, plus my sixth form teacher, who I'd already formed a film club within the school. We used to At Charter Sea? Yes. Okay. And we had yeah. our own film unit, which mm -hmm. I was in charge of. Well, I put myself in charge mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to go out making films about school dances and things like that. You did. And you used it, not, not one of these video cameras, but you had a, a eight, eight millimeter, millimeter mm -hmm. Bell and Howell or something like that? It was a Bell and Howell, yeah. We, we then, when upgraded, we got a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell. Ooh. Yeah. And then, 
as the school year ended, my form teacher said, Look, I know a guy that works in the Strand in, um, in London, central London. The strand oh, being what? A it? street in the... In oh, London. that's a street. Okay. It, it, and it was a little place called Exchange Court, right opposite the Savoy Hotel, posh mm -hmm. hotel there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, he, he, this guy was... I always remember his name was Basil Eames, and he was a film editor. And he got me into this company, which is called Worldwide Pictures. He got me in there as a messenger boy. Now... Oh. That was the only way in. Okay. It was a total closed shop industry, mm -hmm. whereby if you didn't have, belong to the union, then you couldn't work. And you can't get a union ticket without you working. So it was a catch-22 situation. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first battles that I had to fight. So you went to work at a young age, at 18, 17. For, as a messenger, uh, for what was the name of the company? Worldwide Pictures. For, for, you went to work as a messenger for Worldwide Pictures at the age of 17. And uh, did you join the union at that point? Well, that was the point. As I said earlier, you, you can't join the union unless you've got a job. But I got a job, right? right? And then I had to apply to the union. And that's a lengthy process, too. Mm. So, As an apprentice. As an apprentice, yes. Well, they call them camera trainees as opposed to the same thing as a, an apprentice and you eventually you get your what they call a union ticket I always remember my union ticket number 2226 and then you were made you would the, the whole industry then opened up towards you you didn't realize at the time but I did many years later that was the key to wherever you went and I ended up in Hollywood photographing famous people on the big stages there. And it came, came from that. Really? It came from that. Hmm. Um, famous people over the course of years, right? Mm -hmm. Just over the past 20 years? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I photographed them all. Um, one of my most favorite people was Cher, the singer. What a lovely, lovely person she mm -hmm. is to work with. Mm -hmm. okay. And some of the worst people, like Mr. Stallone, when I photographed Rambo. And, Did uh, you do the filming on that? Yes. And uh, that was a, a most unpleasant experience. Wow. But um, he was finding his way. If ever you see this slide, I don't give a damn. <laughs> it was, uh, he was horrible. Horrible to work with, dreadful person. Really? And then I worked with Lee Marvin. It, it, it's oh, there's the, a character. Yeah. And that was the second movie I photographed. Yes. And I, it was an American director and um, one of the old school American directors. Um, he was, like I say, one of the old school. And when the old school, I say, I mean that they know everything about filming. They're a director, they know the camera, they know the lenses, they know the camera cranes, they know what everybody does on the set, which doesn't happen today. And he was the real pro. So I was talking to him one day and um, he said, oh, I want you to meet someone. There was Lee Marvin, and he took me over to Lee Marvin. And he said, this is John Stenny, he's a cinematographer. And Lee looked at me and he said, uh, how do you do, sir? I'm glad to meet you. How do you do, sir? And that was the way it was in Hollywood in the old days. You know, they had res the actors had respect for the position that you were in. And as a cinematographer, you were top of the, the pile on the, on the crew. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it depended you on... You can make them look good or bad, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. But these guys knew that if you were... People like Lee Marvin knew that if I was assigned to be the cinematographer, then I must be good, and therefore I deserve respect. I see. So it's just respect that you got. That you were uh, a cinematographer. Now, now let's go, go back. Uh, uh, this is interesting, but I want to go back to uh, when you were an apprentice, and you got your union card, and... Uh, 
how long did you work as a messenger? Uh, I think it was about, I, I, I transitioned very quickly, I think it was about six months. And then from there you went, and what was the next step? As a camera trainee. Okay, uh, was there a little more pay involved? Yes. you were doing each step? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you went to a camera trainee, which meant to me, it sounds like you're going to be working as an assistant behind the camera with a cameraman. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was in special effects at the time. Oh, okay. So we would help light the fires and do all that. It was great training. Great really? training. Okay. And um, how long did you do that as an assistant cameraman? I can't, I can't remember how long. I, I was an assistant cameraman for a long, long time. But, um, you see... Were you involved in filming uh, plays, theatrical uh, performances, or all movie at first, television? At or? first, I was in TV commercials. Okay. That was a logical step up. Okay. Unless you were a trainee at MGM or something like that. Oh. And I subsequently worked at MGM. You were with BBC at this time? No, no I was with an independent company. Okay. And... Um, they had contracts to do yeah, like work to documentaries work. and I got you. so yeah. that's what you were doing and I, I never worked on a documentary but uh, i always did commercials the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. soap powder commercials and mm. things like that but it it's all the same but no matter whether you're photographing share or you're photographing a, a bar of soap i don't wish to compare the two but the basic skills the basic syntax of filmmaking right. is the same is the same now, when you would take the film, you were using 16 millimeter film. Um, would you then just give the film to someone to develop it, or would you yes. do a lot of that yourself? No, we'd send it to Kodak to be processed. I see. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, so you I, would just stand behind the camera and wait just to be told what to do. You were wait to told what to do. Yeah. You know, um, camera action, and then you were a go. Yeah, it's okay. Good now. Um, but then you, I'm sorry, you had to learn the camera as well. You had to learn the intricacies of the camera, how it worked, how its mechanics worked. You know, and I started loading film magazines in the darkroom. That was my mm -hmm. basic job. Mm -hmm. And then you take them out and they put them on the camera. And, mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. Somewhat. Did you ever damage any film by accident or have any incidents with the yeah. uh, filmmaking? It happened to all of us, yeah. The, the worst thing you could do was what they call flash the film. As the, and you could do that quite easily. You could be loading, because it's all in the dark. You do it all by feel. Ooh. And you could easily forget something and then pull the cord to switch the light on. You didn't have that, a red light or any sort of... It didn't make any difference. Whatever kind of light it was, you know, it didn't make any difference. Oh. So you would... One day, I remember I left the lid off one side of the magazine. Oh. Thought I'd put it on and turned on the light. And then I looked at it and I threw myself over it and switched the light out. It was too late. Um, I didn't say anything. I was too scared to say anything. I thought, I'm going to get away with this. I, I figured out a couple of things. The film is tightly wound, very, very tightly wound. So the light didn't get to it? So it only flashes the edges where the sprocket holes are. And that's what I got. So the next day when the, what we called the rushes that came back, the man in charge said, Jesus, he said, it's been flashed. I, ah, it's all over, you know? But the flashing didn't reach the image. So we blamed it on the lab. <laughs> the lab did it. <laughs> the laboratory that processed it, they were always easy to blame. Because <laughs> they were... An, an anonymous figure way down in the pecking order of the laboratory, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, that's funny. Um, you know, this is when you were working for your uh, contracted company. Um, uh, yeah, how long were you with them? Um, they had a section that did um, motion picture films, mm. and I transferred to them. So I stayed within their umbrella for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I transferred from there as an assistant cameraman, a first assistant cameraman, to um, a TV, a, a cinema series shot in black and white, mm -hmm. and it was called the Edgar Wallace Detective Stories. Mm -hmm. 
and they, we would shoot one every two weeks. Mm, okay. And they would have a week down while they rebuilt the sets and so forth. Mm. And we'd start on another one. That was a fantastic experience. Couldn't mm. hope for better. You know? This is all on stage in the sound stage. Yeah, with actors and actresses, sound stage, you know. And that was kind of your first experience with yeah. this kind yeah, of... Yeah, I always remember walking onto the, the stage and I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do this, you know. It was so awesomely overwhelming, you know. And you're the man. So, you yeah, had to do it. You're the... They expect you to do it, yeah. They yeah. don't expect you to not be able to do it. Yeah. So if somebody puts you up for it, as they did with me, and I, I was cheap as well, and cheapness has always reigned in the film industry. And uh, so I was the man, Friday I didn't make a mistake. I had a job for two years. When you say you were cheap, you were getting paid less than the other um, people, your other comrades that you were working with? Well. I was being paid very well, well above the national average. Oh, you were? Yeah. Because you're on, it's a union situation, yeah. so yeah. there's cer certain scales, I would imagine. There, it was scale, yeah, scales. And you could get over scale as well. Okay. If they wanted you badly enough, you got over scale. But I worked for scale for the first years and then proved myself to be valuable. So they give you a raise, you know, and raise, you know. You go on from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was during that period of time that I got between worldwide pictures and moving on to their movie section that we got the army thing. Okay. And they, they wanted people to volunteer. It'd be great experience. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't want to get shot at, but I'll be, I'll be filming things overseas. Right. And things I never seen before. I, you I was, get to I travel. Was, a I was a city boy, and I'd never been out of London. Right. Yeah. Now what? You, now, now, did you switch companies at this point? No, no. We still. My company had a contract with the what they call the Central Office of Information, which does all the army stuff. You know, mm -hmm. handles all army publicity. Movie so tone news type of thing. Yeah, they handle all the publicity for the army. I got you. So you got they, uh, your company got a contract to do that kind of work? And well, they wanted work. some volunteers to go over and work as... Uh, and you volunteered? Me and a couple of other guys. How, yeah. old, are, how old were you when, when you did it? 18. 18, oh, well, 18 you're still, yeah. This is all happening very in a very young age, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then, okay, let's talk about that. Let's. Uh, and they sent you off. Where did you go? First of all, we went for basic training in uh, the basic weapons of the army. Um, with I, the army, you were with the with, army. Yeah, we got put into the army. And you were as a civilian. As a civilian. They yeah. gave you a, an honorary rank. After the training. After the training. Yeah. And you were paid by the movie company, though. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and so then uh, uh, you went through the training, and then what happened? Um, the first assignment was in Cyprus, and that was to cover the Aoka terrorists. Um, actions. Um, I, I vague, vaguely remember it, so it, I don't think it was particularly exciting mm -hmm. as the next one was, but it was um, nonetheless an introduction to a different world mm -hmm. that I quite took to because being a war kid, mm -hmm. you know, there's a kind of mentality associated with that. So when I went into Cyprus and there was people shooting at each other and things like that, I thought it was pretty odd, but I didn't, it, it wasn't a huge surprise to me, you know, my, to my psyche. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? Um, I don't recall, I think about six months, three to six months. And no, nobody was shooting anybody? There was yeah, they were, they, they were doing it. They, they were shooting British soldiers and cutting their ears off and pinning them to doors and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we never had any direct involvement in that. We only ever, as I recall, filmed the aftermath. Unlike the next assignment, which was what happened, a little uh, different. Uh, uh, did you see any, did you film anybody getting shot and killed? Because that um, had to be a, would be a traumatic experience. N no, we didn't actually, we saw the accidents. That was the bad After thing. After the fact. Yeah. And we saw a couple of, in the second assignment in Aden, we saw a couple of uh, 
detainee shot. They made a run for it, and uh, that was it. You know, they, they just shot him. Okay, uh, and, uh, and, and then you moved on to a different assignment? Yeah, uh, we, we had, then we went up country to the Yemen. Okay. And that's where the Arabs would um, shoot at you and things like that, and uh, at anybody. We didn't have to be in the army. And we weren't wearing uniform either, just a bush hat and mm -hmm. that was it. Mm -hmm. And we were allowed to wear shirts like this. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, there was one particular occasion I well remember and probably never forget. It was, um, it was two actually. It was a Lawrence of Arabia type guy from the SAS. Mm -hmm. We went out to meet him on a patrol. And he appeared out of the mist just like he did in the movie. Um, David Lean movie, you know. <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, Lawrence of Arabia with Peter O'Toole. Yeah. yeah, and this guy appeared out like that. He came and he spoke to the senior officer in charge and then drove off into the desert. And I always remember this officer turned around and he looked at us and he said, we'd never see him again. He's done. He's going to die. And I think he was so offhand, you know. But mm. that's what happened. You did, yeah. Yeah. And then on another occasion, they, the King's Own Scottish Borders were assigned to this sandy tent, a uh, sandy um, fort in the, middle of, in the middle of the desert. And I can't describe it to you, it's just all desert and scrub, and there's a sandy fort. Mm -hmm. And there's some bad guys there shooting at our guys. And uh, they called in an airstrike. Mm -hmm. And um, we had some Arabs on our side, we were all, we were all laying down. And the airstrike came in, and well, I always remember this, there was this crack right beside me. And I thought, oh my God. And I felt something come up inside my helmet. Oh boy. And I put my hand up there, and I took it, and it was covered in blood. Covered. And I thought, Jesus, I've been hit somehow. And then, this all happened in seconds. Yeah. And I looked around, and there was this Arab sheep herder. He picked up a piece of cordite and hit it with a stone, it blew all his fingers off, which went up into my helmet. Oh, man. So, and, and the story got all pieced together. I mean, we bandaged him out and called in a helicopter and took him away, but the story came together that that was the Arab Christmas, and they had access to all kinds of explosives. And they, they used to have in firecrackers, and this guy just had this piece of cordite, I think it was about that long. And he hit it with a rock. And that's what blew his fingers off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Subsequently ended up inside my helmet. <laughs> that had to scare you, huh? Jesus, it did. Uh, I had all the thoughts of like, oh, what am I going to tell my mother? <laughs> and how old are you when this happened? I must have been quite close to 18 by then. You're still 18. 18. Okay, this is 18 and a half. For an 18-year-old, you've done a lot of stuff here. Yeah, but well, it's the film industry for you. you know? Whoa, Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, while you were talking about this the King's Own Scottish Borderers. Yes. What, what, when did you join them? Well, like I say, I didn't join them. The, the, well, I did join them, but not as a regular soldier. We joined them as um, replacements for their film people. So you're, you're yeah. a filmmaker. Yeah. And, and uh, you, when did you go to work with them? Uh, I get the dates mixed up now. They, it's all between the ages of 17 and 19, this whole thing. Okay. What is, what would be the light infantry, or what, what, what would be the King's Own Scottish Borders? What, what, what are they? We, in this country, we don't know. We would are. call them here, we would call them a light strike force or something like that. Okay. You have minimal arm, armaments, you know. Right. And just we had then an SLR self-loading rifle uh -huh. and basic kit, water and all that, and it, it, it's what you were. You were light infantry. I where see. You could scramble over the rocks and get the bad guys. You know. Okay. And That's most what they the, would do, but you would be carrying the camera, filming. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, you, you served Cyprus and Yemen in 1960, 61, at the age of 18. You were in the King's Own Scottish Borders. How long were you affiliated with them? I, I'm not quite sure. It's, it must have been 
nearly a year, six months a year. I, I can't remember. Okay. It's, it's quite a long way off. But I do remember the experiences. All right. After uh, your tour in, in these different countries, what happened to you? Did you go back to London? We came back to, to our film company in London. Okay, and how long were you with the film company and what did you do with them? I didn't leave the film company until 63 or 4. Uh -huh. I don't recall. Um, now, while you were there back in London, uh, when you weren't working, um, what were you doing? What, well, I immediately went freelance. I met this guy called Peter Allwork, who was a big figure in my life. Uh, he, Peter uh, Allwork? Allwork, yes. Okay. He was a great, great cameraman. Okay. And he'd worked in the early days of Technicolor and things like yes, that. Uh -huh. And he mentored me okay. into when I became a first, first assistant. All these things are kind of mixed up in, in my brain. I can't be precise on dates. I know that it happened between 1959 and 1961. Okay. All right. Um, uh, what else did you do? Did you like to go on your private time? Uh, did you race cars or uh, did you have a particular type of car that you like to drive around or did you, were you seeing anybody of um, importance to you at that point or, um, or or was most of your time spent just working and involved? I was going to say most of the time I spent working. I mean that's, that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, okay. You so wanted to be involved. That in was this. your work and your hobby. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And but the uh, army experience never left me scarred or anything like that, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I, I remember coming home uh, from uh, Cyprus, uh, and they said, "Oh, you're brown, you're sun tan." You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go on to the next level here. Uh, what kind of car did you drive? I had a used Ford. Ford. And I used Ford, and. Uh, did that was have, my pride. Were you joy. living with your family still? Or? Yes. Oh, so all this is with your family yes. while you were doing all this? Yes. In the same house you grew up in? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, when did you get your own place? I can't be sacked on the date, but it was in the 60s. Uh, I got married when I was 23, 24. Uh huh. And uh, I lived with my dad for a while, for six months. Okay. Saved up the money and bought a house. Good for you. And you moved in with your wife at that point. Yeah. What was her name? Uh, Patricia. Patricia. And uh, you had any children by her? Yeah, I had four. Okay. Uh, and they all lived with you in this house that you bought? Yeah, as and they were born. Yeah, a couple of them were born there, yeah. Okay. Um, the um, when uh, when did you actually get involved with the movie business uh, and making movies? Well, I was always involved in making movies, and I was always in the movie business. And uh, I never left the in business. In the filmmaking business, but you 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 left the army, the Scottish Borders, and. Um, did you stay with this company? Well, I think there's a misconception here um, about the Kings and Scottish Borders. I never joined them. I was assigned to them. You were assigned to them working for? Working for the Central Office of Information. Oh, okay. But we were treated as though we were in the Army because we had to be able to be a transported, uh -huh. an Army stuff, and you know the rules and regulations. Right, you know, right, right, right. Civilians can't do this, and civilians can't do that. Mm -hmm. So. That, that, that was, um, okay. I guess I was, a, um, how can I put it, I guess I was an amateur soldier. Right. I can't put it It's in like you see these guys in the news, you know, running around filming everybody, but they're not, they're not actually carrying a weapon, they're carrying 
uh, news equipment and cameras and, 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 and We We um, had the choice of carrying weapons because uh, we'd been trained prior to that. Mm -hmm. But none of us did. I mean, we were too too busy trying to absorb what was going on around us, you know. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, so anyway, now you're living in London. You're 23, 24. Uh, where did your life take you at this point? Um, you, you said you had some children. Um, how long did you stay married to this lady? Um, about 10 Patricia, years. Patricia? Yes, about 10 years. And then you all split, is that right? Yes. Uh, and then uh, did you stay in the house or did you give the house to her? She stayed Gave the house? house to her. Okay, and then what happened to you? Um, I went off to live with uh, another lady Okay. for a while, three years. All right, what um, was her name? Her name was Eileen. Okay. That, that turned into a major disaster. Oh, okay. And I was, um, I then had the realization that you're a big boy now. You've done a lot of things in your life. You're now 25, 26, yeah. 27, yeah. <laughs> you, you've done a lot of things in your life already. You know, you, you can really do without something like this. And I drew this shield down. Mm -hmm. I said, that's it. That's the past. It's gone. I'm now really going to concentrate on myself. And I was single. And that I did. And I never, I never looked back from that point onwards. Okay. It was a reincarnation of John Stenier, you know. Okay. A revelation, as they would say. Or a revelation, whichever, yeah. And then where did your life take you at this point? When you, once you put up the fence and went your own way, what happened? What did you do? It took me all over the world. I mean, I was became a popular uh, technician. And I traveled the world. You know? And then after that, I became a cinematographer in 1980. You see the steps? That you have to go through. I'm trying to understand the steps. Uh, I see the steps, but I don't know if I really understand it. A cameraman is different from a cinematographer. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I like for this camera you've got on me here. Someone's behind that. He's a camera operator. He's he has he has an assistant that pulls focus, does the focus. Okay. And the bottom of the line is the loader that used to load the camera with film. Right. So there's those three stages. And then there's the cinematographer. So that's the He's overall stage. Yeah. in charge of all these people yeah. working the camera. Yeah, and the electricians and all the other people. And I but see. You're in charge. Usually on a movie, you're in charge of about 200 people, maybe. And you've got several cameras going, don't you? Yeah, you can have several cameras. And, yeah. and the cinematographer's in charge of all the yes. cameras. Okay, so yeah. that's quite a job. Yeah, it is. But if you're trained okay, it's... Not a big deal, you know, not a big problem. It's when you're not trained that the problems arise. And you're saying that some of these new people today just are not trained. No, they're trained on a computer. Oh, yes. You know, and, uh, which is fine. I don't, I don't have any problems with that. But my training was in depth. I knew everything about film. I knew everything about lenses. I knew everything about equipment. I knew everything, how it's supposed to be done, just like... They don't even use film anymore, though. They no. use they use the video uh, yeah. memory cards. Yeah, yeah, that's for they have digital. Great cameras digital, but they have some great cameras for that. I've worked in that medium quite a lot since it came out. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I only retired last year, so. You we saw the transition over to the video because mm -hmm. some of the you, you from I, I went to uh, New York Film Academy for a month as a kind of a workshop just to get a handle on all this. And it was right um, when it really the transition was taking place. And you can really tell the difference between cellulite film and, and uh, digital. It, it was very, the bigger the screen, the, the fuzzier it got. Hmm. Is that, does that sound about yeah, right? That, that, it, it, is, it seems to be changed now a little bit. Uh, yeah. The, the definition is what everybody goes for now. Definition, I mean, yeah. High def. A high def, an ultra high def, and it's not really not needed. Um, it, it, the, the bar was set by film, and I'm not saying that because I came from film, but I've worked in 
both mediums. And I know friends of mine have been fired from movies because of um, the vi digital captures so much detail. You can see wrinkles in actresses' faces, which you're not supposed to in, see. In a high definition yeah. face? Yeah. I mean, oh. An actress called Susan Sarandon didn't like the way she was being photographed digitally and had the cinematographer fired. Really? Yeah. Because he. The, fil the, the, the digital image was so yeah. defined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's only film people that know how to fight that. Oh, man. Because the guys that have been raised on the computer, that's what they go for, is low light and high definition, you know? Yeah. This is this, this BS, this total BS, you know? Uh, it's like, we used to say the three Bs bullshit baffles brains, you know? Um, so you were the man, you are the center photographer, and you never got fired from a job, did you? you, no. you were you, sen you were sensitive to people's wants and needs in yeah, front of the camera. Yeah, you have to be, yeah. yeah. Um, Especially actors. Uh, okay. Uh, now, you're living alone, or you're living, uh, on, you're on your own. Uh, when you went out on your own, did you get another place, another house of yours? Yeah, I, I lived in a, uh, a three-bedroom apartment in the area that I'd been raised in, you know, not far from my old house. Okay. Did you have a favorite pub you go hang out at? Yeah, we used to have that. Yeah. The what Woodman the Pub. The Woodman. The Woodman Pub? Yes. Right around the neighborhood? Yeah. All my, my whole generations of people and parents and all that. Always used to go to this pub. You know? Oh, so everyone knew you, and yeah. and you'd go in there, and yeah, everyone's glad to see you. And then, yeah, yeah, the Woodman's Pub. And what was your favorite drink to imbibe? Oh, I think it was the bitter ale then, because even in the '60s, it was real stuff that came out of a wooden barrel. Yeah, and it wasn't compressed up with whatever it is, carbon dioxide or whatever. Yeah, well, they, yeah, they have to to get it to go in. It was real beer, it wasn't... Uh, pull it right out of a, a barrel. Yeah, but the pump, when they pulled it, pumped up the suction to suck it up out of the barrel. Yeah. Um, oh, it was a, it was a it, real it, pump. It yeah, wasn't, it didn't need... Yeah. yeah, it was a real pump pump. Okay. And... Um, and we used to drink the beer warm. Yes, I know the British used to do yeah. that. Like that famous thing about the British guy saying to the American, is the, or the American saying to the United States, which one it was, drink your beer before it gets warm. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, United States beer, like, like it would be cold, people liked it cold because of the weather out here. It was so hot yeah. that, yeah, that sure. you, you had to have it cold. In but England, it's always so cold you wanted it hot. Yeah, you, 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 not now, it's always cold. <laughs> Okay, uh, you still had your little Ford you drive around in, or had you upgraded now to a little more upscale car? Yeah, I, at that time, I joined a company called Desilu. Oh, yeah, um, out of uh, LA. Uh, with, uh, they, with, they were CBS people. Yeah, with, um, what's her name, Lucy, Lucille Ball. Mm -hmm. She used to run it. And I'd met her when I was an assistant in London, and she came to do a show called um, Lucy in London. Okay. And she was impressed with my camera assisting. Oh. Because I could reload the camera instantly, you know. My fingers were like, shh, shh. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went, uh, gee, that's fast loading. She'd been used to waiting for a long while while they reloaded the camera. And being a business lady, she saw time as money, you know? Right. And we did these, what they used to call Western Reload. And my assistant and I used to do this. Before she could even walk off the set and sit down, we used to yell out, camera ready. And she's very surprised at that. And then she said, these guys have got to work on I Spy with Bill Cosby. And uh, So then we ended up working for Desi Lou, traveling all over the world. Really? And I Spy. I spy. I, 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 
I didn't realize. I remember seeing I Spy with Bill Cosby. That was a Desi Lou production. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you were on I Spy now for how long was that? How long did that go on? It was a couple of years. Yeah. And, we traveled everywhere. Uh, did you get over here to uh, L.A.? Were you in L.A.? No, no, I wasn't allowed to work here oh. until later. Oh. And subsequent movies that I worked on that were shot here, like Fame and Death Wish and all those that I, I photographed, uh, I didn't photograph Fame. But I, the company, MGM was so powerful they could get you a work permit easy, you know, just like that. Mm -hmm. So I got work permits to work here. Oh, okay. Uh, but your home uh, base was still in London throughout yes, the whole time. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I can't, I'm sorry I've jumped the gun a bit here, but I'm just kind of thinking all well, the memories coming back. You know? Yeah. It was, uh, what I'm trying to do is when you go out and you think of these things, I'm trying to bring you back to where we were when... I know. You know, um, so I can keep some, a little bit of chronology going uh, in your life. Uh, when you went to work for Desi Lu, how old were you when that happened? That was 1968. So how old was I then? 40, 48, so 10? You were about uh, 25, 26. Yeah. And you were with Desi Lou a couple of years, you mm -hmm. said? Mm -hmm. And did you get to meet Desi Arnaz too? No. Yeah, they, I, only they, Lucy. Had already, they had already split by that point, I guess. I think so, yeah. yeah. I always remember Lucy, she was a fireball. Fireball. I mean, not unpleasant, but uh, she didn't suffer fools. She was focused on what she wanted to do. Her company, yeah. She, it was her company. Yeah. Yeah, totally focused on that. Um, all right, now this is sixty-eight, sixty-nine. Uh, in your personal life, had you had you gotten remarried by this point? No. You were still a single guy. All right. No, I was still married to the first wife. Oh, you were in that pit in that period of time. Oh, you never got divorced. You split. I went your I own was, way. Yeah. But no, no, no. I didn't actually split until nineteen sixty-nine. That was the actual divorce. I don't, I'm getting the dates mixed up now. I remember I was working on Midnight Express in 1977 when I got the divorce papers. Oh boy. Uh, I've, I've screwed you up now, haven't I? And, you know, I'm just trying to follow you. Um, uh, in all this period of time, she was living separately from you, though. You were separated, is that right? No, no, we were married. Oh, okay, you, you were married, you lived together. All right. All uh, through that last period of time from the first introduction into the film industry, mm -hmm. right up until 1977, we were married. Okay. All right. That whole period of time. All right. Um, in 1977, that puts you at about uh, 35. Um, where, what were you doing at that point? Um, I was working on uh, big movies. Uh, big time movies with a director called Alan Parker and uh, where was he based? in England okay and I, I did movies with him I did um, three small movies with him uh, one large one called Bugsy Malone I then, remember that I remember. then I went on to um, Midnight Express Fame uh, The Wall Pink Floyd The Wall um all over that period of time, I was a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 1980 that I'd gone through this disastrous affair that I mentioned earlier on and ended up living on my own. So That's you've got to take that chunk and put it back in there if you want. Okay. And then um, I went off on my own, like I said. Mm -hmm. See, I've just missed out a whole chunk of, of time. I've given you the facts, but I've got the mm -hmm. time wrong. Okay. It's, it's very difficult. Um, well, let's just move on. Uh, you come back to it. Let's go to 1977. And um, you're, you're starting a new phase of your life now, right? Yes. OK. 
okay so let's let's just start right there uh, and uh, see where that goes here okay what, 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 uh, you're, you're now doing midnight Express yeah and you're doing all this other filming uh, where were you living at that time um, I was living with this lady that we subsequently had this dreadful okay. separation all right and when I said to myself I'm gonna be on my own right that's it Okay. That was a three-year period after 1977, so that takes us to 1980. Okay. What happens now in 1980? So then I become a cinematographer. Okay. And have a measure of success mm -hmm. and become very popular. Mm -hmm. And for the next... People are calling and wanting your services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, until we get to 19... 85. And all that time I've been traveling all through Europe. My um, route through Europe was always uh, London, Paris, Barcelona, Madrid, and Rome. Mm -hmm. And that was the circle I used to do. Mm -hmm. So that kept me busy for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then. You were uh, staying in hotels throughout yes. the period? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, I came back to England. I not came back to England. I started working for a director there in TV commercials, who was very famous. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an assignment in Los Angeles mm -hmm. in 1984. And uh, I met my, what was to be my third wife there. Mm -hmm. What was her name? Kimberly, the one I married Kimberly, to. Kimberly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this was in 1985, you said? Yeah. You met Kimberly, her maiden name? Um, Evans. You met Kimberly Evans. She was the love of your life, was she? It turned out to be, yes. Yeah. Um, and you married her, and you lived together in London? For a while we lived in London, but um, we traveled the world after that. We didn't have a home. I just went from job to job to job. And we just kept going around the world. And she came with you? And she came with me, yeah. Well, that was fun. You enjoyed yeah. each other. Yeah. Um, any kids by her? Yeah, four. What are their names? That's, um, oh no, three. Oh, sorry. Um, I've got John Senior, or Jake. Uh -huh. um, I've got Tyler. Uh -huh. There's two. And then I've got Tessa, who's with okay. me now, down here. And uh, and you say Tessa's with you here? Yeah, she came down to visit from college. Okay. And um, so John Jr., uh, how old is he now? 25. Okay. And what's he doing? He's working in virtual reality, the, the, the process known as virtual reality filming. Really? Which he, I've said to him. He took after his dad. Yeah. He should do that down here, come to the museum and do virtual reality. You know what it, do you know what it is? I, I know, I've, uh, uh, that, that's where you kind of put a hood on and... They're just and the goggles now, they're like this big now. And, and your hands can move and yeah, everything moves? your head moves and you can... Because you I saw a film uh, with uh, Michael Douglas using one of those um, type of things and it was really amazing. Yeah, it's getting better by the day. Really? I saw some film the other day of uh, two Portuguese kids, and in front of them they got a console, like an airplane cockpit, basic controls, rudder and stick and throttle. And they've, they put on the goggles, and they're inside a Messerschmitt, and they're inside a Spitfire. And they fly it, like this. And they dogfight. The can the, the, the uh, cameras are fitted inside the model planes and uh, they take the basic images and then that's transferred into reality. So these kids then can fly anywhere they like using the rudder, stick, throttle, all that. And, and they just wear these goggles. And it's amazing because you see what they're seeing and you're, you're the pilot, you're looking through the gun sight. Well, we could use that right here in the museum. Yeah. 
you're actually looking through the gun sight and you're flying up it's like a simulator but you're in the plane. all you need is the basic stick rudder pedals and yeah. throttles and the visuals and everything you it's just exactly, put on your head exactly what a pilot would see but as soon as you move the stick so does the vision and if you move your head that's it you're moving your head around so you get a different view and when you see these kids operating it you see them going like this and like that <laughs> because they're turning the planes oh boy and 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 and, uh, and they uh, shoot john jr where, where does he live he lives in hollywood in the um, right by the hollywood side well yeah you need to get him out here he, uh, and 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 see the museum out here um he's, he's been here when he was a kid okay and what what's your other son's name tyler tyler where's he located he's in santa barbara going to school yeah okay. and uh, he's studying kinesiology i don't know what i forget theology yeah uh, that I forget. I, I know he had to be cut a cut a cadaver open the other day. Yeah, yeah. So he wants to be in the med, medical field. Mm -hmm. And your daughter? Um, she's an avid artist, you know, okay. and she's very gifted at painting and creating and things like that. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know how she's going to wind up, but she's in Santa Barbara too at school. Oh, the two of them are Yeah. And then they're going to transfer down to um, San Diego. Uh, university? Mm -hmm. University of? Yeah. Um, very good. And, and now, do you live here in Palm Springs now, uh, John? Uh, yes, I do. Well, the, reason, um, the reason I ended up in which we didn't go through the United States in the first place is because um, of really meeting Kimberly. That was one of the reasons, and I knew I had access to the United States. I had many. You had a work of, visa here for yeah, a long time. Yeah. From your um, uh, previous work. Right. With the, was it Desi Lu? Who, um, no, MGM. MGM got you the work permit. Yeah. And which is essentially a green card, right? Yeah, I got a green card first, and then uh, I was married by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my green card, and then uh, we. After our travels, we moved here to the United States, and I lived mm -hmm. on my green card. And then we got married in the United States, in New York. Mm -hmm. And then I got my citizenship mm -hmm. the hard way, uh, the real hard way. I was discriminated against at every stage of the operation. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet my housekeeper, the Mexican housekeeper, got a work permit in three months. Yeah, got Why were you discriminated? I don't understand. Because I, there was a thing going around that I was discriminated against because I was an educated white European. And those people were discriminated against. All, all my colleagues who subsequently became citizens had the same problem. They're not people like you and I that interview you for your citizenship. They're ethnics. Yeah, I would imagine. And they see somebody like me, they, 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 they say, screw They're you. jealous. Yeah. I mean, they used to see, send me... I, I have a lady friend down in Florida. She was a neighbor of mine on a beach. I call her, call her Lady Anna. She, she's been here for 25 years. And she's a master's degree. She went to Oxford from England. She's on a green card and has not got her citizenship. And I've been trying to get her to get her citizenship. I said, you know, you don't know what they're going to do. You know, they can change the rules. And and uh, she she started to do it. And she was having a, a similar problem that you just mentioned. And she still hasn't got her citizenship. She just kind of gave up on it. Well, I'll just tell you what happened to Kimberly and I. We went to, rather than go through the lengthy process down here at the federal building, mm -hmm. we went to St. Louis, where she was born, and I lived there for a while. You lived in St. Louis? We, yeah. That's where her family's from. Oh, okay, now that makes sense. So we went back there to the immigration place. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And the lady said, asked a lot of, she was an um, African-American lady, and she asked a lot of, very personal questions mm -hmm. and she said to, to me do you remember when this marriage was first consummated 
I said, excuse me, I said, I don't think you really need to know that. I mean, why would you want to know that? And she said, oh, like that. I said, I said, you're discriminating against me. I came out with her, you know. I said, you're discriminating against me. She said, oh, really? She said, um, I see here your number one of 56 or something like that. She said, now you're number 2,000. She put me to the back of the line in the, in the main computer as the vicious step. Okay, that's what she did. And I went to the back of the line after a year and a half of trying. And I'd gotten up to, say, 56, and now I was back to 2,000 because of this lady. Did you, uh, was there some action you could have taken? Well, yeah, I used the common sense in the good old American way. You know, I've always figured that in the United States you can do anything you like, you know, if you know how to do it. Right. So I went to my lawyer, Ralph Aaron Prees, great lawyer, immigration lawyer, in uh, Century City. And I explained the situation to him and he said, oh, oh, he said, okay. He called in all his uh, other lawyers into the room and he said, Mr. Stanier here has a problem. So, 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 and he explained the problem. And he said, now what would you guys do to get him out of it? And they all went scratching their heads like this and looking at each other, nothing. He said, obviously nothing's going to come out of this. He said, well, I'll show you something. And he picked up the telephone. I'll never forget this. He picked up the phone, he dialed a number, he's on the push button dial. And he said, oh, and he suddenly became not aggressive, but very passive. And he said, oh, Mr. Gonzalez, how are you? This is uh, Ralph Aaron Priest here. He said, I have a client that has a problem. He said, his immigration number is so, 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 so. He said, uh, I wonder if you could uh, help me out here. And he looked up, he said, yes, he's now to number 2000 or whatever. Okay, he put the phone down. And he looked at us all assembled in the room and he said, okay, he'll call me back in 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, just stay quiet until that happens. So we all sat there. It's Kimberly, my wife, Ralph, a bunch of lawyers, and the phone rings. And he picks it up. He said, oh, Mr. Gonzalez, how are you? Good. 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 Thank you very much. Put the phone down. He said, you're now back not to 56, you're back to 50. He'd spoken to the guy that operated the computer. Just like the lady in St. Louis that put me to the back. He spoke to the guy that operates the computer down at the federal building and put me back to 52, not 56. And that's what I said was a good old American way. There's a way of, there's always a way to find things. In England, and the, there was always a lot of procrastination. You know, how are we going to do this problem? will eventually get through the problem, but they would procrastinate. And I find Americans are not like that. You know, they get, if there's a problem, they try and sort it out straight away. Yeah. And so using that theory, I told Ralph, and Ralph changed it all around. There was a TV show, I, I like to watch BBC. There was one called Yes Minister. Yes. And it's just what you were describing. The whole... TV series is just about what you're describing about the procrastination and no one really wanting to do anything, mm. you know. Yeah. And and uh, just trying to feather their own nest for yeah. their own. You know. I mean, it was hysterical. I I got a kick out of it. I, I'll take that one one final quick stage. Um, to go down and get my uh, documents, you have to stand in line all the way around the building, right? Mm -hmm. He said you're not going to have to do that. He said, right at the entrance, there'd be a guy in a brown suit carrying a briefcase. So go up to that guy and tell him who you are. Give him a hundred dollars cash and mm. see what happens. So I found the guy, gave him a hundred dollars. Looked all official. He walked straight to the front of the line to where they stamped the things, you know. Mm. He put the papers over there and I was out and done in ten minutes. Yeah, okay. Another example of the good old American way. So uh, obviously from what you're saying is you like it here versus being in England. I think it's the best, greatest country ever. And I, I'm very loyal to it. And uh, I don't have any uh, 
problems with it at all, apart from it's not the America that I settled in, it's just like it's not the England I settled in, it's come round again, you know? <coughs> now, how long have you lived out here in the desert? Uh, uh, six weeks. Oh, you're brand new. Yeah. Uh, whereabouts, do uh, you live in like Palm Desert or oh, We live in Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage. Okay. We've had friends out here for the past 30 years, they run a restaurant called Lavender, and uh, we've been out to visit them. They, they used to own the Valerie's, and then they own... Oh, I've heard of that. They own three restaurants, and uh, we visited them, so we're very familiar with the place. Okay, and then uh, your kids, uh, John Jr. and the others, will come out to visit you. They come out, yeah. They've, yeah been okay. out. They've all been out. Well, um, <clears throat> it's getting close to time here. So is there anything else you'd like to add and throw on the camera here before we shut down? No, I've always had a, an affinity to the, uh, the United States Army Air Force in England. Uh -huh. I thought that was uh, an amazing happening. And all those people gave up their lives to defend a country that they didn't even live in or for a cause. That... You're talking about the, the, United, the Americans here? Yeah. Um, during that time, uh, as you know, the whole world was involved in it, yeah. and we knew we were getting in. And they, uh, some of these guys just wanted to get a jump start on it. And uh, it is an amazing. We've got several people you haven't met them yet, probably, since in the short time you've been here in the museum. But we've still got several people that uh, volunteer here that did just exactly what you were talking about during the war. And as time goes on, you'll meet these guys, uh, hopefully before they pass. Yeah, They're they getting up there now. Yeah, they must be, yeah. Uh, we're losing one every um, um, every couple of weeks. One of them seems to be taken out of service here. And uh, uh, if I see you in, in, in during the time, because I'm here quite a bit when I'm not running around, uh, I'll introduce you to a few of them, because um, they're great people to know, because I, you just don't know how long they're going to be here. Mm, right. And uh, with that, John, I'd like to wrap it up, and uh, I want to thank you for volunteering your story to us. 